Welcome to Design Downtime, the podcast where we celebrate the joys of living a balanced, creative life. I'm your host, Guy Siegel, a design director in Toronto, Canada, and I invite you to join me on this journey as we redefine what it means to be a successful design professional. Let's break free from the shackles of hustle culture and embrace the full spectrum of human experience because life is too precious to be spent only in pursuit of productivity. Today, I'm delighted to be talking with Katarina Koberdam. Katarina is a design leadership expert and coach from Germany. She is best known for creating the Design Leadership Framework, which helps design leaders be more strategic and structured in managing their teams. Before fully dedicating her time to coaching, Katarina worked as a UX designer and lead, collaborating with organizations across Europe. Her passion has always been to make complex things easy to understand, whether it's a user interface, a customer journey, or the abstract challenges of managing a UX team. She holds a degree in business administration and specialized in human-computer interaction and user-centered design for her diploma thesis. This combination has enabled her to bridge the worlds of design and business effortlessly throughout her career. In her personal life, Katarina loves listening to music, drinking coffee, and traveling. She is married and has a two-year-old son who keeps her very busy. Katarina, welcome to the show. Hi, Guy. It's so nice to be on this podcast. Thank you for inviting me. The pleasure is all mine. So you want to talk to us about an interesting topic, which is Scandinavia. Yeah, Scandinavia. I, I, I was thinking, what is one of the biggest passions in my life outside work? And, and I would say it's Scandinavia. And I think my friends would say so too. Maybe first of all, uh, Scandinavia, what, what do I mean with it? So it's mainly Sweden. Denmark, Norway, but I would also include Iceland. I think it's not technically part of Scandinavia, but it's one of the Nordic countries. And yeah, I really like a lot of things about it. I like traveling there. I love the music. I love Swedish or Scandinavian design. I like kind of the way of living they have up there. So yeah. So as you know, I like to start with the origin story, where things began for you. So where did this fascination or passion for Scandinavia start? I think it started with Scandinavian music. And um, it's quite a long time ago uh, when I was in my mid-20s. I was still at university. So I had a lot of free time also besides <laughs> studying. I had a lot of free time to yeah look into what is it that I like? What music do I like? Who's me, you know? So it's kind of like forming my own taste, my own personality. And at that time, MySpace was still a really big platform. And um, I discovered it around 2007 and um, discovered some Swedish singer-songwriter there. Um, her name is Anne Brun. I was immediately intrigued by her music. It's kind of like something that's uniquely Scandinavian is like it's very deep it's melancholic very emotional and it's it's a quality you don't find so much in for instance German singer-songwriter music and also not in the like Americana folk song it's a dif different vibe I would say and I was immediately drawn to that and from there you know if you remember MySpace you could like hop from one artist to the other so if you liked one Swedish singer-songwriter in my case, then you would find, you know, who are they making music with? So I discovered many, many more artists that I really liked. And I was kind of like, wow, this is a whole new world. This is kind of like a revelation for me. I always loved music, but kind of like, I thought now I have found my, my crowd. <laughs> yeah. And so it was a really inspiring time. I also bought a guitar then myself and wanted to write similar songs and sing. And it was very insp inspiring. From there on, I thought, okay, let's listen to some concerts of these artists that I discovered. And luckily enough, I was living in Berlin at the time. So many of them I could see in Berlin, but some you had to travel to Scandinavia. So that was kind of my first first travel all on my own and so I kind of planned a Scandinavia road trip so I thought okay I have a vacation time let's do two weeks um, and move from Stockholm 
to a, a town that is more southern in uh, in Sweden, which is Malmö, and then go to Copenhagen and then back to Berlin. Yeah, and that was, again, super exciting. I mean, I've been doing vacation before, like the vacation you do with your parents or with your friends, you go to the beach, this kind of uh, summer holiday. But this was kind of like the first time traveling with staying at the hostel, being, you know, by myself, journaling, discovering again, a lot of discovering, I think, um, about this new places, um, artists, new ways of living, um, but also about myself at that time, I would say, you know, like becoming, becoming an, an, a proper adult, I would say. I'm curious to know, you're listening to this music that comes from Scandinavia and you recognize something that is maybe not present in the music you hear from, from Germany, from, from the US. Did that give you the desire to go and explore what is, what kind of place or, or culture creates this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, that was something that made me curious and it kind of, it, I think this, uh, there's also a lot of explanation for that because it is, Scandinavia is very far in the north of Europe. It is very dark for a very long time of the year. So there is a really nice summer. Um, I would say something like June to August is really, you know, long uh, nights and um, really nice weather. But kind of the rest of the year, it's it's cold. It gets dark really early. And I think this is something that kind of creates a vibe that is maybe different to other places. And also, yeah, it's very empty, so to say. So there's a lot of space with not so many people. So in Sweden, I think it's something like nine or 10 million people living there. But the country is, I don't know, much, much bigger than Germany, for instance, and or, or Denmark, a couple of million people living there. So you have a lot of space, a lot of wide open nature, a lot of very pure nature still, I would also say. And People are mostly living in a few more metropolitan areas, I would say. And then you have all this white space. And of course, if you're very up north, you also have the northern lights and this kinds of thing. So I think I think it could be the explanation why there is a different uh, vibe in music there. I mean, there's also a lot of like heavy metal metal bands coming from up there. It's not my type of music, but there I heard they're also very special from these regions. Yeah, so maybe that's the explanation. So you travel, you have that first travel by yourself. People do a lot of the same things that people do everywhere. You know, go to a beach, you know, they go to restaurants or, or clubs or uh, museums and galleries. What is striking you as different from your, your home culture? Yeah, so, I mean, of course, it's not it's not a culture shock when you go there. It's not that different to, for instance, Berlin. What I think is immediately, you know, this is different is style in general and an affinity for design, which you can see sort of everywhere. If you are, for instance, in Sweden or Denmark, I mean, it starts with architecture. There's just so incredible architecture, especially in Copenhagen. There's art everywhere, the interior design. It, it doesn't matter where you go. There's, people seem to have more emphasis on aesthetics and design, uh, especially this what Scandinavia is known for, this more minimalistic design, and that is apparent everywhere. Also, the people are just, most of them are just looking really, you know, how to say, well-dressed and trendy. Um, and, but differently than in Berlin. In Berlin, you have a lot of very diverse styles and um, from crazy to very conservative. And Sweden is more, I would say, it doesn't have this many extremes. It just looks like many people are just looking really well-dressed and yeah, presentable. <laughs> if you come from Berlin, I don't know if you've ever been to Berlin, but in Berlin, it's, it's much more rough and different, different vibe different vibe. Yeah. So there's more uniformity or, or a consistency in Scandinavia? I would say yes. And and I read about that somewhere that it's for Scandinavian people, it's, it's a little bit uncomfortable or more uncomfortable to kind of stand out from a crowd. So 
I would say, yes, you can see a little bit more uniformity there in style and trends and kind of like, same goes for interior design. It does look great everywhere, but it also looks very similar in, in the style. But still, I mean, you have to admire them for this kind of putting design first, also in places where, for instance, in Germany, you wouldn't find it. Like you go to a, a government a building or something like that. It just looks very conservative in Germany, I would say, or boring, so to say. And if you're in Copenhagen, it's just there's this emphasis on architecture and style and design that is, is really, really stunning if you haven't seen it, if you haven't been there. So as you're visiting, maybe even after that first visit to Scandinavia, are you starting to explore more? Is this something that is starting to take over your life? <laughs> yeah, in a way, I would say, yeah, it, it kind of took over uh, a lot of things. So I yesterday, in preparation for our podcast, I counted a little bit how many times I was traveling after that. And I, I'm not quite sure, but I think I went something around 25 times after that uh, to different places in Sweden and Denmark and Norway, uh, Finland, Iceland, and um, in, in various contexts also. So uh, traveling to different cities, exploring the different um, more metropolitan areas, I would say, like Stockholm, Göteborg, Malmö, Copenhagen, uh, like the, the capitals also but also visiting the countryside and the more rural <laughs> Sweden and Denmark, which is which is completely different, but also very nice. You know, I mean, the cliche is the little red wooden houses, and um, but it really is like that, and it's a very picturesque if you if you go to um, more the countryside um, of the Scandinavian countries and. It's also really nice. So we did a couple of, of holidays there also with the family, just renting a vacation home in the middle of nowhere, really close to a lake, going hiking and swimming and this kind of things is also really nice up there. And a um, couple of years later, I also uh, went for a real hike. So not just vacation, but really with a backpack and then hiking uh, through the north uh, of Sweden, which was also really, I would say, a life-changing experience for me. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so it was, uh, so I have to say, I am not really someone who goes hiking a lot. It's not my favorite uh, uh, hobby. Uh, so I was speaking to a colleague at the time and he said, yeah, there was this really nice hiking trail in the north of Sweden and uh, you should try it if you like. Sweden. So I thought, yeah, let's do that. So I was completely naive. I didn't know what to expect. I bought some hiking boots. Um, I asked a friend if we want to do it together. And then, yeah, we booked the flights and we booked the accommodation for the hike and kind of went. <laughs> so it, I, I didn't have any idea. And um, yeah, it is a, it's a very famous hiking trail. It's called the Kungsleden, which translates to uh, the King's Trail. And it's, I think, the most popular hiking trail in Sweden. And there is kind of like a beginner's uh, section that you can easily hike in over the span of uh, seven days. It's roughly 100 kilometers. And it is very, very comfortable if you're not used to hiking because there is like a cabin at the end of each day. You can uh, sleep in a, in a cabin that you rent. So it's always kind of like the walking distance of one day and then you you have a cabin. So every day you sleep somewhere else. And so it's you don't have to carry a tent or this guy. So it's it's for beginners, I would say. And it also doesn't have a lot of altitude because you're walking next to the mountains, but not up and down. So it's really, really good to hike. There were people in their 70s even hiking there. And yeah, but I said I wasn't prepared <laughs> and I didn't know what to expect. And it, it was really like the first day. I think it was like... 15 or 16 kilometers, which doesn't sound that much, 
but it's a lot if you have an 80, 18 uh, kilogram backpack and really big hiking boots and all this. So I wasn't prepared for that. And I thought, okay, we have to go back. I'm not doing this. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> so the first night in the first cabin, I thought, okay, we, we will go home the next day. Can't do it. But some somewhere overnight, I found my confidence again. And and of course, we, we pushed through. And it was, I think, one of the most amazing experiences of my life. It was seven days just so close to nature, which is when you're from a big city like Berlin, you never do that, actually. There was no cell phone reception. There was no electricity the whole trip. There was, um, you had to bring your own food and prepare it in the in the cabins. Uh, you would drink the water directly from uh, the, the little river that f was flowing through uh, through the area. Yeah, and that was just, you know, I, I think you can imagine it's just a completely different thing that still 10 years, it's 10 years ago now, but I still remember it very vividly and also teaches you a lot about mental strengths because there are so many times during the hike where you think, ah, I don't want to do it anymore. It's I'm exhausted. Can we stop? But you can't because you're in the middle of nowhere. And you certainly don't want to uh, hire the helicopter to take you out because that's the only way to get out of uh, from the hiking trail. So yeah, you have to push through. And it taught me a lot also for my for my job actually that sometimes it's hard and you have to keep going. So yeah, a lot of mental strengths from from there and and you meet so many people on a hiking trail I, I didn't know that you would like meet so many people and talk so much every evening there was a in the cabins you have a sauna Sweden, Sweden has a lot of sauna culture so every evening you would go in the sauna and then talk with all the other hikers about your day and it was just a completely great week of my life I would say yeah, and it just was really, really up north, above the polar circle. Very different landscape, also with reindeers, and you know, it's it's uh, very special. So that is interesting because you mentioned earlier that first time coming to Scandinavia, we're staying in a city, and you had that comparison between Berlin and the Scandinavian city. Now that you've had a chance to explore the countryside or the more uh, rural area. How do those compare with the the ones in Germany? Yeah, I would again say it's it's much more quiet and empty. <laughs> so there is really not a lot of people there. So in Germany, also the rural country areas are still quite dense, and there's a lot of agriculture, which shapes kind of the landscape. So in when you go, I mean, Germany is, is either it's forests or it's agriculture. And so a lot of fields, wheat fields, these kinds of things. And in in Sweden, it's more like forest, lakes, rocks in the, in the north of Sweden. Of course, in the south, south of Sweden, you also have a lot of agriculture. Yeah, so it's much more rough, I would say. Not many people. You don't see many people. <laughs> you can drive a long time in your car without seeing anyone. I thought it has a very, a very special atmosphere because also next to this hiking trail, there's this interesting town uh, in the north of Sweden, which is called uh, Kiruna. And it is uh, a mining town. It has one of the largest mines for iron ore for the which is they're shipping worldwide also and this again is such a different vibe in the city when you have this huge mine that kind of overhangs the whole town they actually had to move the town the whole town they had to move it one kilometer to to the side to get more of the iron ore and so it's very industrial atmosphere up there and then combined with this very pure nature and again up there it's also the the land of the uh, sweet and uh, not swedish of the native indigenous people up there which are called the 
Zami, I think it's pronounced. So you see some of these uh, towns also, and which have the traditional housing and the reindeer and these kinds of things. So there's a lot of contrast up there. We, of course, cannot talk about Scandinavia without exploring the food. Mm, that's true. Do you guys have IKEA in, in Canada? Probably, right? So you so you probably know the, I think the famous Swedish dish is uh, the uh, Schöttbula with um, potatoes and uh, uh, cranberry sauce. This, I think, is like the export <laughs> dish, Main, mainly because IKEA, I think, is serving it everywhere. But yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, other nice things. I mean, if you ever go to Sweden, of course, you have to have Kanelbola, which is the cinnamon rolls that are very, very popular. You can also get them with um, a different spice that is popular up there, which is cardamom. And they also do the cinnamon roll with the cardamom. Um, it's also nice. And there's a lot of seafood, of course, because you're, you're close. At, also in Norway, of course, a lot of seafood. Um, yeah, but I would say uh, the the Scandinavian pastries are actually underrated. So all the stuff from the bakery, they have really nice cakes and this kind of things. Yeah, definitely worth trying. I'm curious to know, were there any, I'm sure you had assumptions before you started traveling in Scandinavia. What were some things that surprised you? Yeah, I think what I mentioned earlier, the a little bit the uniformity of things in contrast to Germany surprised me. So in, in terms of style and fashion and interior design, so it's all very nice. But as you said also, it's it's more uniform than it's maybe in Berlin or in Germany in general. And I, I mean, I'm not from Sweden, so maybe someone from, from Sweden could explain it better, but there is this concept uh, that you don't want to stick out too much. And this is... I would say the opposite of Berlin culture, at least. I can't speak for the whole of Germany, but in Berlin, it's, it's you want to stick out. You want to have the most interesting dress or hair or things, you know. And so it's 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 a um, very different to Berlin, I would say. And what also surprised me in general was this atmosphere of everything is okay here. So there's I mean, maybe it's different now than 10 years ago, but at that time when I traveled there the first times, it really seemed like there are not a lot of big problems there in terms of everyday life or culture or something like that. What are some things that you would, or are there things that you would like to bring from the Scandinavian culture to the German one that you wish was more like that? That's definitely the music. I mean, oh, maybe <laughs> mm, a German pop music it is just horrible, really. If for anyone who really enjoys, I don't know, it, it sounds a bit arrogant, but if you are into music and you listen to a lot of music, it's really, a lot of music is not very nice in in. Germany and it seems that the the music culture in Scandinavia is a little bit different, a little bit more sophisticated, I would say, appreciative of creativity and trying out new things. I have also heard that they have, I mean, because there's so many also known artists coming from Sweden and a lot of singer song and a lot of songwriters also come from Sweden. And what I heard is that the music education also starts very early and there's a lot of talent development there. So it seems like music has a different value there uh, in terms of yeah, what, what people appreciate. And here, if you listen to this kind of music, it's very much in a niche. And very many people just listen to, I don't know how to call it, it's really difficult. Um, four to the floor, <laughs> pop music. Yeah. 
So the the appreciation for this kind of indie singer songwriter culture, I think, I mean these artists that I have that I enjoy from Sweden, which is Anne Brun, but another one is called uh, Frida Hivernen or Christian Schillanda or this this kind of people. They won the Swedish music prizes. They are not in a niche there. And this type of music would be very alternative here. So that's something I, I appreciate. As well as this emphasis on design. I would so much like to bring this here. It, it starts if you just go to the public library. If, if you watch a video of how Copenhagen library looks like, and then you go to the average German library, it's... There's, there's not this much emphasis on making it nice, thinking about interior design, this kind of thing. What's next for you in Scandinavia? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question because I'm, um, as, as we said in the beginning, we have a two-year-old son, so we haven't, I haven't been traveling for a while. The last trip to Stockholm was in 2021. I was pregnant at the time. That was actually an interesting story also because since 2019, I'm trying not to fly anymore. So I was thinking, okay, how can I get there without flying? And there's an 18-hour night train that goes from Berlin to Stockholm. And I thought, okay, let's try that. And yeah, that was an interesting experience on its on its own. Um, especially when you're pregnant, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so so since we we had our son, um, it's just too far away to travel there by car or by train. So I'm kind of patiently waiting <laughs> for maybe maybe next year we can maybe have a family vacation, go to Denmark or Sweden, and yeah, just do a more kind of family holiday there so in terms of what's next yeah i'm still connecting to a lot of swedish music listening to music a lot from there reading watching uh, netflix shows that are located in sweden because i also started learning swedish a little bit so that kind of fun to watch them them in original uh, version in danish or swedish or norwegian so that's also some some way to bring Scandinavia home. <laughs> Are you uh, looking forward to introducing Scandinavia to your son? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm so looking forward to that, to go there because it's, I mean, especially if you, if you do kind of like a countryside vacation, it's so nice. I mean, you can do all these things like swimming and um, kayaking and um, biking, you know, this kind of holiday things uh, and and i think it's such such a nice place to go with children because they're also very children friendly up there the culture is very open to having children around yeah so i think that, that that's going to be great that's awesome katarina where can people find you um people can find me on linkedin for sure i'm also active there so posting every now and then something from my work and I also have a website for my design leadership framework, which is designleadershipframework.de. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Guy, for inviting me. Bye-bye. This is all for this episode of Design Downtime. Thank you for joining me. And until next time, I hope you enjoy your downtime.